Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, without further ado, we have uh, Piers Nichols here to talk about uh, the Laydown Project and, um, and this uh, fine contraption over here. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, Jeremy and I have been, uh, and some other folks who are unable to make it, have uh, been working on building ocean-going uh, sailing robots. So our long-term goal is to build a uh, sailing robot capable of sailing around the world all on its own, totally autonomously. Uh, since that's kind of a big, uh, a big lift, in the shorter term, we're working on completing the microtransat challenge. And what that is, is that's a uh, transatlantic sailing race for autonomous boats, um, speaking of autonomous, that um, has been held every year since 2010. Uh, no one has finished yet. Uh, the maximum size of boat is eight feet, which means it's pretty cheap to, uh, to get out there and compete in it. Um, there's a boat in the water right now from a Norwegian outfit that I think probably has a fairly good chance of being the first to finish west to east. Um, we'll see how they do. So, prehistory uh, on all this. Back in uh, 2011, uh, three Rick Johansson, who probably some of you know, uh, proposed uh, after, after midnight at Hagerbot Labs that wouldn't it be cool if we built the first autonomous boat to, to travel all the way around the world. No one done it then, still nobody's done it uh, today. Uh, so a bunch of folks, including Jeremy and uh, some other folks who, who are not here, uh, worked on planning various parts of that. Uh, but then we... Um, but that original effort didn't get much past the, uh, the paper boat stage. Um, back in 2014, we decided that we really wanted to get something out for uh, what was then the third tour camp out in Nia Bay. And uh, we went out and we bought the cheapest uh, two-place fiberglass kayak we could find on... Um, find on Craigslist, and boy was it cheap, um, and rightly so. Uh, we brought it out to Tor Camp. It was not really ready for prime time, and uh, we tried launching it into the surf, and it promptly rolled over. So, well, that was a little depressing. After that, in 2015, um, we fixed the things that were obviously wrong. You know, we made the battery attachment better, we improved the way the, uh, the, way the hatch covers were attached, um, added external status lights. Basically, everything that was annoying or really bro went poorly uh, when we tried it at uh, Tour Camp 3, we, we fixed that. Um, we also made some changes to the software, so it would hopefully work a little bit better. Um, we brought it out to Tor Camp 2016, and while it was stable that time, um, it didn't actually do very much. 2016, 2017, we got the software all fixed up, um, got it to navigate to waypoints, got it to uh, report its position and status up to the cloud. Uh, we had some steering issues with it, but what eventually put that, uh, that boat in mothballs was the fact that both the motor and the battery died. I have a couple of maps of uh, where we actually went testing it around, um, around Elliott Bay, right outside of Seattle. Uh, the one with all the, the blue arrows, this guy is when we finally had it out, like navigating to waypoints on its own and all that. The reason, the reason all the paths are curved is because uh, we had a problem in the code with calculating the magnetic uh, deviation, so it followed curved paths to its target. Um, that, was th that was the trip, uh, our test, on which we uh, killed the motor and the battery. So we put, we put that uh, up on this. We hang it from the roof of HackerBot Labs, and it's been there uh, for probably a year and a half now. Um, in the middle of that, we started building this sailing demonstrator, which is the boat that we actually have on stage here. And this is some pictures of it when we, uh, we started putting it together. Uh, it's all laser cut plywood. It's the simplest possible design of a boat that you might actually be able to sail somewhere. The, the bow is plumb, the stern is plumb, 
the sides are plumb, and they're just two circular arcs. Nothing complicated. Um, the only internal structure, other than some bulkheads to give it some stiffness, is uh, places where the mast pivots go, which is the, you can sort of see the cases for them here, and then the dagger board case here, which the keel fits through. And then, you know, here's the hull after we got it all painted and fitted out. And uh, other than some scuffs in the paint, it looks pretty much the same on stage here. Uh, oh. So I don't have any pictures of the first set of sails we tried to build for this, because they really didn't work very well. Well, at all. That is a better way to put it. Um, and you can see here what the wing sail looks like without its skin on. It's got that kind of uh, egg crate structure that uh, Jeff talked about that his boat is built with. Um, again, all laser cut plywood and 3D printed, 3D printed fittings for the, ta uh, for the tail booms and uh, all that stuff. Uh, and then you can see the, the completed one after we got it glued on, coated with epoxy, got all the sort of low points filled in with epoxy putty. Uh, when we clamped it, we just used a, some, uh, some straight pieces of wood with uh, big foam pads under them across, uh, you know, to, to sort of just clamp the uh, skin onto it. Uh, I had reason to cut into the wings. You can see where I covered it over with silver tape uh, recently to install some sensors. And I discovered that the internal fillets, which of course we did, uh, we'd done entirely blind, right? We just sort of gooped on some... Uh, epoxy with fillers and crossed our fingers, that it actually all got into exactly where it was supposed to be and it's um, a really strong structure. So the two other really important parts uh, of the boat are the keel, which is that big blue thing you can see down there. Our first cut at a keel was way undersized, so, this is, so the boat, um, you know, if the keel's not big enough, the boat rolls over. <laughs> Uh, which is, of course, what it did when we put it in the water that way. Uh, so we made uh, this larger keel. It's a steel tube uh, filled with lead shot, and it's got, um, again, 3D printed end caps to give it a sort of nice hydrodynamic shape. Uh, the other beast here is the brain box for this. So it has a beagle bone blue as sort of the main brain that has a compass and IMU on it, which is... Uh, you know, tells us which way the boat's pointing. Uh, you know, and more sort of very makery off the shelf stuff. We have a Adafruit GPS there, uh, RC receiver, so we have some manual override on it. Cell modem, so it can talk to the rest of the world. And then a Daisy AIS receiver, so, um, so we don't have to have any unpleasant conversations with a Coast Guard about getting too close to a ferry. And this boat we've actually sailed uh, in Green Lake. So we've also dry sailed it on a, um, on a pivot. So you can see uh, the Green Lake, um, we have it on a nice tether. Uh, the nice thing about the tether is that it meant that we couldn't sail it, uh, so we had to go swim after it or rent a boat to go after it. We could just haul it back when we didn't quite have, uh, quite have our sailing dialed in. Um, and the other one of these is attached to a pivot um, for uh, Seattle Mini Maker Fair last year. We got a big fan, put it in front of a pivot, put a random walk on the, uh, on the tails, and it sort of sailed itself around. It's a great visual demonstration of how the sailing works. Um, these tails that it has on it were the original 3D printed tails, and they were too small. So we replaced them with what you see now, which is... You know, I, I keep saying laser cut such and such. This boat would not be possible without a laser cutter. Um, some laser cut balsa with the th absolute thinnest, lightest fiberglass uh, surfacing veil that we could find uh, over it. And even that, you know, it's barely there fiberglass uh, made the, uh, the balsa wood so strong that you can't break it anymore. Um, which is good because I'm always afraid that I'm gonna break these tails when I'm handling the sails. So, let's talk about how the sailing works. Uh, so, as you can probably see, these wing sails are uh, free to rotate. Uh, 
the uh, position of the sail relative to the wind is controlled by the tail. So it works, it's pretty much analogous to the horizontal stabilizer on an airplane in that it sets the angle of attack of the sail. Um, so if you, in, of course there are two of them. And the reason that we have two of them is that it means we can delete the rudder. Um, any, anyone who's done any offshore sailing um, is probably familiar with rudder failures. Uh, also, if look at one of the nice things about the microtransat challenge is that uh, all the competitors are on a mailing list and they talk about why the boats didn't work. And probably more than any other single, single class of failures, other than getting tangled in fishing gear, is, uh, is breaking rudders. So we designed that failure mode out. Um, uh, and the way we designed it out is that we have the two wing sails, so we can set the sails differentially, right? And if you set them at slightly different angles, you get a torque around the center of the boat, right? Which is, you know, just what a rudder gives you, right? An ability to apply a torque to the, center, a torque to the boat, and that lets you turn however you want to. So this is our demo boat, and here's our microtransat configuration. Uh, it's 2.4 uh, meters long, about eight feet. Uh, it's made with a bunch of slotted together transverse and longitudinal bulkheads um, that make it very, very strong. And then the reason it is pink is because this is just uh, router cut pink slabs of pink foam. Uh, all glued together, sanded to a nice fair uh, surface, and then glassed over. And then you can see our keel uh, hanging down below, which is again, a, you know, a just like this boat, a big steel plate with a steel tube welded to the bottom and filled up with lead shot. So the main computer for this is Beagle Bone Blue, again, because it's basically a can of robot, right? It's a Linux computer. Um, it's got Wi-Fi on board. It's got an IMU on board, so we know where we're going, and we can talk to the rest of the boat. The wings have uh, Arduino MKR1000s in them. That's, again, actually the same as this boat. Uh, the nice thing about the MKR1000 uh, versus another microcontroller with Wi-Fi like the ESP32 is that it's uh, significantly lower power which considering we're powering the whole thing with solar panels and, uh, and batteries is kind of a big deal. Uh, I will say one more thing, one more advantage of this configuration with the tails controlling the sails is that our actuator power draw is, also, is really low, only a couple of watts per sail. So talk a little bit about what sensors we have on it. So the Beagle Bone Blue, as I said, has an IMU. So that gives us a compass direction and also it gives us the pitch and the roll of the boat as we're sailing along. Um, that'll let us, among other things, estimate sea state when the boat's out in, in the middle of the ocean. You know, if it's, do, if it's doing a lot of this, um, the weather's probably kind of rough. Uh, it also has a temperature sensor, um, which is nice for figuring out what the weather is. Uh, and barometric pressure, which also gives us some read on what the uh, ambient weather is. Um, beyond that, in the main hull, we have, of course, GPS for location, because um, really, what, what else would we use? Uh, everything else is much more complicated and expensive. And also, has a receiver for the automatic identification system. And what this is, is every large ship over, I think the legal requirement is 300 tons, uh, has to, to broadcast every minute or so its current location, speed, and course. Um, and that means that we can stay far away from fishing vessels, we can stay away from cargo vessels, when we're in the sound we can stay away from ferries. Um, you know, not just because they're going pretty fast and they'd run us right over, but because I think sailing an unmanned vessel near to one would, would cause some uh, uh, uncomfortable discussions with the Coast Guard. Uh, then on each sail, uh, we have another IMU that measures the orientation of the sail. And since we all know the, we know the uh, current tail command and the orientation of the sail, we can estimate the wind. 
which is important to being able to, to sail the boat where we want it to go. So I've broken communications into two different categories. Uh, there's the inshore communication, which is us testing in the sound, and that's the, an RC receiver, uh, which is just the manual override. You know, we, we're, we're pushing it off the dock. We want to sail it off the dock by hand. We use that. And then it has a cell modem, so it can just hit the internet and say, hey, I'm from wherever I am. Uh, then when we get to offshore, we're looking at uh, RockBlock uh, for an Iridium satellite connection. Uh, nice thing about the RockBlock is it's relative, it's cheap for satellite con connection, which means it's about $300 worth of hardware cost and um, something like a quarter of a kilobyte, quarter per kilobyte uh, for, for um, bandwidth cost. And we'll probably also put a spot tracker on board just as a backup GPS uh, location. Also inexpensive hardware. Okay, so I would talk about how we're gonna power this thing. Now my favorite part of the power system is that we're gonna power the sails by molding in flexible solar panels. Um, I actually have one of the solar panels down at my camp down by the maker stage if you wanna come see it. I got it from a uh, we, we bought it off a, uh, a Chinese outfit called Glory Solar, and it's like 18 watts and like so. So it's a pretty efficient, uh, pretty efficient panel. Um, we have one on each side. And I, I looked at it, I figured the easiest way to do this was to use each panel to charge its own string of batteries, and then we just choose the highest voltage, um, which gets us a little redundancy on the power system. Uh, main computer uses, uh, it's probably going to end up being two, but we originally planned for four uh, solar panels of exactly the same kind mounted on the deck. Same kind of, uh, you know, one string per solar panel charging. Now, so now I'm going to talk about software for a while because honestly, any robot is. Um, a big pile of software with some appropriate hardware uh, wrapped around it. Um, you know, like Bunny said, the, the hardware very much governs what the software can do. So you start with uh, what the software needs to do and then wrap the hardware around it to figure out what that needs to, you know, what that needs to be. Now that's ideal right now. Uh, the software is running way behind the hardware. So. It's built around something called Moose IVP, which is a, uh, it's kind of a middleware for robot, uh, for sailing, or not sailing, for maritime robots. Um, it's, uh, most of the development is out of the University of Oxford and MIT. Uh, the real advantage of it for us is that it has a lot of uh, modules off the shelf that do things like marine obstacle avoidance and marine collision regulations and you know how to do how to run a set of waypoints things like that um, it plays well with the beaglebone blue which when i tried to install ross uh, on the beaglebone blue it didn't work very well but moose you know first time uh, it also has a lot of built-in mechanisms for getting the bandwidth of status reporting down because again, most of the people who are using this are on low bandwidth or expensive bandwidth kind of links. Um, most of the custom uh, software we're having to build for it is either configuration specific or specific to our, to our particular hardware. Uh, the sail controllers, no one's ported Moose to Arduino yet, so we have a, a um, Arduino REST interface on them which is you know, reasonably easy to use. So, uh, so this is a software configuration which is just sail it under manual control. Uh, so green stuff is communications, RC receiver. Uh, we wrote a module that taught, speaks something called SBUS, which is what the RC receiver speaks. And then we have you know a mixer internally for that. And then we have, um, this module, PA REST, which goes and talks to the two sails, which I put in red because they're actuators. So that's the minimal, take it under RC control and go sail it, you know, go sail it around the bay, right? 
Now, to build up on that, we want to add some GPS and AIS inputs, which is um, uh, the PGPSD. What that does is that takes the output of uh, GPSD, which is software package that parses GPS and parses AIS, um, and it makes that available so we can log it. Um, P logger, which is here, it's uh, paler because that's an off-the-shelf one. Uh, then can log all that stuff. And then uh, we also built an interface that lets it talk to um, Adafruit, the Adafruit IO service. I don't know, any of you familiar with that? Basically, it's a cloud-based, you know, hey, write some data, right? And they have, uh, they have some nice dashboard tools. It's kind of limited, but it's good enough for what we're doing. Um, it's also relatively cheap and easy to use, and it's it's kind of one more thing we don't need to f need to mess around with. S nice thing about doing it this modular way is we could just keep larding on modules to do more and more. So, you know, first time we want to take it out on its own, um, we bring up Helm IVP, which is sort of a uh, it's a module that comes with Moose and it lets you take uh, a bunch of behaviors, like say follow waypoints, and run them in, in, uh, inside the Helm process, and then it outputs based on, on whatever you've told it, you know, what behaviors you've told it to follow, uh, outputs a go this direction this fast, right? Uh, then uh, to also make this work, I have a little MUX module that lets me switch between uh, manual and automated control, things like that. Um, and then I'm currently working on a module called Wing Sailor, which actually turns go this direction this fast into set the foresail tail to this angle and the mizzen tail to this angle and do that thing. But th this stack of software is only really good for, you know, the um, putzing around the sound, right? Making sure the rest of the boat works. Uh, then when we want to actually go offshore, we need to add a few more things. Uh, we had, need to add a module that talks to the rock block. Um, we need to bring up the contact manager module, which is, again, a provided one which every time you see, hey, the AIS says there's a container ship that's about you know, 10 miles away that's on course to run me over, um, contact manager spawns the avoid, avoid uh, collision behavior. So it, it sails away from the thing that's gonna run it over. Um, and then we have, a, of course, a power manager module because we need to keep everything going. So that's all the boat software. We need some, sh we need some shore side software too. Um, so Adafruit IO gives us uh, sort of a monitoring and control over cell modem uh, capability. Um, I don't have to, I don't have to mess with a server or anything like that. I just sort of, you know, send them a few bucks every month, and it just works. Um, their data rate and their widget library are a little limited, though, so it's not great. Um, for future inshore operations, it would be nice to have a custom web app that it can go say, here, have some data, and then it'll cough the data back up, um, and some sort of dashboard to be figured out when we're there. Um, for like, for real offshore work, uh, the rock block, you know, you send little datagrams, and then the rock block uh, company server goes and hits a web app that you tell it to hit to dump the uh, data out. So we'd have to actually build that. Okay, so here's where we are on the boat right now. Um, we've got the hull all catted up and we're working on getting all of our ducks in a row to get that, uh, all those pieces cut because unfortunately the largest pieces of wood for that are bigger than the uh, CNC router we currently have access to. Um, the wings and the tails, uh, I've got the tails all made and glassed up. I just need to do yet more sanding um, on them to, to get them ready to go. Uh, I've made all of the molds for the wing spars and the wing skins. Um, the CAD for the wing is 
uh, somewhat variant from what actually from what I actually got built. So I got to update the CAD to, to reflect what I actually built. Um, on the electronic side, I've had the PCBs for a few, and components for a few months, and I've been busy with other things, so that isn't isn't done. Uh, I've written all of, or we've written all of the software except for the rock blocks and power manager modules. Uh, those are kind of future, so we're working on getting all the other ones tested up and make sure they're all working. Testing is naturally behind. So now that I've yacked about software for a while, um, I have pictures of building the uh, various parts of the, uh, of the wings for the, um, for the microtransat boat. So the first thing I did was, was the tails. And I figured that the easiest way to, ca to build the tails was to cast them. Um, I'm not sure I feel the same way anymore. But the first, so the first part of making a mold is you make sort of a male plug. Um, and again, laser cut plywood, in this case with a polycarbonate, uh, heat bent polycarbonate skin over the outside of it. Makes a nice smooth mold and I was able to actually pour this rubber, you know, two part rubber mold around it. Um, that went pretty well. So what I did with that was I wanted to cast in the, um, the axles for the tail pieces. So I cast uh, basically foam the foam cores of each, each of the tails uh, in the mold that you saw earlier. And then I, uh, you know, filled it up so they're pretty nice surface and then glassed that over. Um, when I glassed it, I, I got access to uh, vacuum bagging, which if you're doing fiberglass, just like makes it so much better. It's, um, and what you do is you basically wrap it in a plastic bag and, and suck all the air out. So it clamps the, um, clamps the fiberglass across against whatever you're covering with fiberglass. So you get a very, very dense, uh, it tends to suck out most of the air bubbles. Um, and it's very dense, very nice uh, surface. And it feels like it takes a little less work. So for the wing, we also needed to build a plug. And it's got you know, a big aluminum piece of uh, rectangle that sort of is the main strength for it. And then uh, uh, plywood ribs to, uh, to form the shape. Now, so the polycarbonate worked so well for the, um, for the tail mold that it decided we are gonna do the same thing for the um, for the wing mold. Um, heating uh, what was really about a four by eight sheet of polycarbonate up so that we could uh, bend it around the, uh, the nose radius, uh, we needed to get, the, to get some fire. So we got a big uh, steel tube, the right size, drilled a bunch of holes in it, took it to a place called Hazard Factory, um, Re shoved a propane burner down the whole length, set it on fire, and I, I have probably more pictures of us standing around waiting for it to get hot enough up to forming temperature than any other stage of the b build because, you know, we're standing around for mm, 10 or 15 minutes. Usually, I don't have barely any pictures of uh, actually putting fiberglass on things because wearing gloves to keep it off my skin, uh, epoxy it turns out will, uh, will give you allergies if you have too much skin contact with it. And then you don't get to use epoxy anymore um, because it's a sensitizer. Uh, and you know, if I'm wearing gloves covered in epoxy, I'm sure as hell not gonna touch my phone. <laughs> so I, I mostly have pictures of it like this, of putting the, uh, the skin molds or pulling the skin molds off of that uh, plug that you saw in the last slide. So I have the leading edge, um, both you know, while it was curing and afterwards. You can see you know, the inside comes out as a pretty nice finish. Uh, and then you can you know, vacuum bag a skin onto, that, onto the inside of that. And then it's just like the right shape um, and very light. And then 
So, the, and here I have the, uh, one of the side, the, the mold for one of the trailing edges uh, is all laid up on it. Unfortunately, I didn't get any pictures of it after I popped it off. Um, but the inside looks similar to the other one. Now there's a, uh, up the center of the sail, there's a, there's a spar that's formed by two hat shapes. And the way I made that one is actually the same size piece of aluminum as the wing, but uh, I used a router to cut a bunch of, um, of uh, foam, you know, foam sections, right? Just two inch thick foam sections and stacked them up, glued them together, uh, covered them with one layer of fiberglass, and then uh, the first one I did by hand, the second one I did, uh, I, I applied that fiberglass with a vacuum bag, the second one came out much, much better. <laughs> um, vacuum bagging is just awesome. And then I hand laid a mold um, here. Now, this mold here, um, it came off the plug, it was perfect, it was straight, it was beautiful, and I loaded it in my car before it was completely cured. And as a result, it got uh, about a, you know, I'd say about a five degree, a five degree bend and 15 degree twist, which meant uh, I had to do it again. Uh, this is about five layers of fiberglass, and uh, I did it all in a single, single shot. Um, by the time I was putting the top layer on, the bottom layer, the inside layer was starting to kick. So it was uncomfortably hot to touch it. <laughs> uh, anyways, how am I doing on time? Uh, well, I have lots of time for questions. Um, so team members, of course, Jeremy's here. Um, Alex couldn't be here. Uh, here, Alessandro is definitely involved with this, but he's uh, since moved to Colorado, and Dylan Gray, who also cannot be here. And uh, let's see. So acknowledgments of folks who've really helped us out in one way or another. Uh, Hackerbot Labs, where we're based. Um, the facility at Edmonds Community College, uh, where I've been doing a lot of machining and composites work. Uh, it's makerspace based out of community college. It's pretty awesome. Uh, Hazard Factory and uh, Rusty, who probably some of you know, uh, helped us with the uh, with heat bending of things and welding other things. Uh, uh, Beagleboard.org uh, has been kind enough to give us some hardware. Uh, Leviathan and Frank uh, Height have also been a big help to us, and the Arduino folks have given us some hardware as well. So, links, uh, have a blog that I should update a whole lot more often than I do. Uh, Hackerbot Labs also has a blog, which I also need to update. Um, we have a GitHub, uh, GitHub Project Laid On. You can uh, see the state of our software and uh, maybe even give us a hand on that. That's, uh, you know, that's one of our pain points is that need more software help. Um, if you want to just give us some money, we have a Patreon uh, under our old name, Hackerbot, or Hackerboat, I mean. And uh, we're also on hackaday.io, which is yet another blog that I need to update. Okay, so I have about probably 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So, any questions? Okay, I think you went a uh, orange jacket. Yeah. Uh, what size of lead shot do you use, and why not just free flow uh, lead in your deal? So I think uh, the lead shot we ended up using was number four, and that's just because it was on t uh, the first uh, size I saw when I was at Cabela's buying a bag, um, <laughs> and it's a lot easier to. Um, uh, to use lead shot than it is to pour lead, right? Because I could just, you know, it's a bag, I cap one end, you know, I pour the lead shot in until there's enough, and then I glue on the other cap. Um, I don't have to do all the setup for, uh, uh, for, for, you know, doing a melt and pour with lead, because it requires a fair amount of safety setup 
to do that without, you know, poisoning yourself. And you had a... Yeah, um, so the, the boat that, that had the motor and battery die, what, what happened to that and, and uh, what, what would it have taken to replace that? So uh, we got, the batteries got donated um, and replacing them with new batteries. I mean, they're big lead, big lead acid truck batteries. So it's about 400 for the batteries and about $100 for a new motor. So we decided we'd rather spend it on sailboats. Uh, we may reverse that decision at some point. Uh, and in the gray, Uh, so just eyeballing it when we were test sailing it, sailing it up at, uh, at Green Lake, um, it looked like we were able to make progress up to about 15 to 20 degrees off the wind. So it sails upwind really well because you can't luff the sails. And, and Gray? Uh, yeah, uh, the hull shape that you have there is a kind of non-traditional hull shape for sailboats. Uh, what are the advantages of that shape? It's really, really easy to make. <laughs> uh, really, that's that that is its advantage. Um, all of the shapes are very easy to to understand because it's just two arcs. Um, it's it's vaguely sharpie like, um, and looks a little bit like some of the advanced sharpies that uh, Phil Bolger uh, designed but it's even more simplified than that because it has no rocker on the bottom. It has no curve on the bottom. Um, yeah, it's basically just easy. How far does it sail out of the water? Uh, with this keel on it, it the water line's about there. Notice in the, either New Mexico or Oklahoma, the keel, I can see that would be a problem. Yeah, uh, in open ocean, this yeah. would be make a hook that would yeah. be really good at collecting uh, seaweed, <laughs> fishing gear, everything else. So on the ocean-going boat, the keel is swept back, and there's no protrusion. So if it does, you know, pick up some weed, it'll just go down and out, rather than slowing the boat. Uh, uh, green hat in the back. Uh, is there any uh, idea to make a break or something on it? To, uh, to lock the sail into position, or is that just stupid? So we wouldn't we wouldn't <laughs> want to do that, right? Because the the best position for the sail in the case uh, so for instance we were in a storm and we wanted to depower is to just uh, feather the tail so that'll point this directly into the wind, which is about the lowest uh, air resistance. You know, lowest wind force that it could possibly have is when it's pointed directly into the wind. So on this boat, we I can't think of any circumstances when locking it would be advantageous. Um, and for handling, it's better to just take the sails out of the boat. OK, you had a question, then you. Sure, I was wondering about how the boat performs under various light conditions. Uh, you mentioned there are some batteries on board. Um, and so how do you kind of handle charging them so we haven't done all the calculations for that. Um, so the expectation is that uh, for for microtransat, um, we can go several days uh, without any, uh, you know, with with basically nothing. Um, the thing is, is that for the North Atlantic, if we did have that sort of extended period of uh, no, no light, we'd probably want to uh, feather the sails because it would probably be a big storm. In which case, if we feather up the sails, we can shut down the, uh, the tail actuators and uh, really reduce our power draw. And part of the, you know, what I was talking about with the power manager software that we haven't written yet, is sort of starting to shed off that, all those loads. So we're just, burning the minimum amount of electricity. Uh, and ultimately, the system uh, will be set up so that if we lose all power, um, we just drift until we get some sunlight. And you had another question? Yeah, um, um, there was a question about uh, uh, waves and, and storms. And um, now, I, I just 
having, I've never done this personally, but I know that Jack yeah, Aubrey like and Stephen Natchman and they would always point their sailing ship into the waves. So i just wondering if you have any, any uh, logic for how to deal with very bad weather conditions. So our logic for bad weather conditions is feather up the sails and let it drift. Um, because ulti because they're, you know, ultimately a, an autonomous boat like this differs from a crewed vessel in in a number of ways. First of all, there are no unsealed deck openings, right? Um, that that's the first big thing, right? Which means that if we have green water on deck, we have green water on deck. Who cares, right? Um, in those kind of conditions, we probably aren't getting any solar power anyways. So. We're, we're, and it's a sealed boat, so eh, it happens. Um, the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, sailing vessels, you know, like those, uh, you know, age of sail uh, square riggers were not self-writing, right? If they went, you know, if they heeled too far over, they were going down. Um, this boat will write, self-write from 180 degrees, right? So if a wave rolls it over, a wave rolled it over. It's not a not really a big deal. Uh, it hel also helps that it's small, which means the amount of um, you know the water on this part is going that way, and the water on the other part is going that way. Uh, it's a small lever arm, and the difference isn't that the velocity difference can't can't be that large. Just physically can't be that large. Uh, on this boat, probably not that much. The axles on these are just eight millimeter stainless steel rods. Um, it wouldn't, you could bend one, you, if you really wrenched on it, you could probably bend one just grabbing it here and pulling real hard. Um, this boat is designed to hang around on Green Lake and verify that our software and electronics are sane. Okay, I think you you were first, and then you. How are you powering the servos over the back through the, the hole? Like, how do you get that up when it's spinning? Is there slip rings or what's the? Nope, there is no no connection. So this boat, since it's just a test boat, it's just battery power, right? Um, so this piece of tape is covering the electronics compartment there, and actually I'll take it off and actually why don't you come by after and then we can take a look at it. attracted a lot of attention for developing uh, a battery that would charge itself based on kinetic energy And I was wondering if you've heard about this? So, so we looked at, at different variations on that. Um, I mean, it's definitely on our, uh, on our radar. Um, so we, the problem with a lot of that is that, it, so it's like you have a pendulum connected to a, uh, to a generator, right, is one way to do that. Um, you end up with a fair amount of mechanical complexity, uh, and our design philosophy has very, very much been design out ways for it to fail, right? So things are solid state, we don't have any slip rings, we don't have a rudder, right? So we're really averse to adding anything else that might fail. The other thing, there is a simple version of that, which is like a little strip of piezoelectric with a weight on it. Um, if, you, uh, uh, if you have a car built in like the last 10 years, it has a tire pressure monitoring system. And those little sensors are powered by a little bit of uh, piezoelectric stuff with a weight on it that, that does this while the tire's spinning right? and, and, and powers that. Um, and the problem is, is that the, free, the uh, roll frequency uh, isn't high enough to get an appreciable amount of power out of that. So, yes, we've totally looked into it, and it's not really appropriate for our particular architecture and what we're doing. And, Gray, you had a question? Um, error detection, like, if something does break while it's out there, uh, do you have any, uh, like, position sensors on the, on the wing or 
uh, to tell that it's not doing what you wanted it to do, or we do. We have a uh, we have a full IMU in each wing, um, and we use that under normal conditions to uh, sense the wind direction. If the two sails suddenly start support, you know, reporting radically different values, then clearly something has gone wrong. Um, the problem is at that point, all it can say is, hey, I'm broken, right? There's not anything we can actually do about it. Unless it's in Puget Sound, then we go get it. So, understanding that you don't want to add anything that you know, can break. Once you get this functioning and it's crossing the Atlantic and you thought about putting a camera in it so you can see like all the stuff that comes by or like what's going on. We will probably have a camera. Yeah. Well, well okay. <laughs> Unless someone gives us a whole lot of money, we're not going to be live streaming anything from the middle of the Atlantic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, if they want to, if they want to pay for that kind of bandwidth, we will a hundred percent take their money. But um, uh, yeah, so cameras and hydrophones are two of the things that we have been thinking about it on there. So. For, to me, that's, you know, that's mission payload. If it breaks, it's loss of mission, but we still get the boat back. The everything shall be as simple as possible, um, or as, and we, we shall design out as many failure modes as possible, is more you know, ship systems rather than mission systems. Uh, do the conditions of your challenge allow any uh, off-boat processing if it communicates autonomously? No. Oh. It's all on board. But the thing is, is that everything it needs to do, it can do on board. Um, one of the software things we've been thinking about adding is wind chasing. So, um, because we can take publicly available wind data and uh, National Weather Service publishes a global wind forecast for the next 48 hours every six hours. And it's on a one mile, on a, uh, one minute of arc grid, which is about a mile. Um, so the data to do that is definitely there. Um, however, I'm not quite confident enough in my own software engineering and test to uh, to want to take the risk. And looking at the wind condition, you know, the average wind conditions across the um, across the course, it's much better to just drift for a little while and then the next band of uh, storms or whatever comes through and you keep going. So it takes a little longer than it would if you were actively trying to chase the wind. But since just finishing is, is the big challenge <laughs> right now, uh, you know, want to focus on, uh, focus on that. Uh, so a big one is have, is rudder failure. Um, another one is getting picked up by fishing boats uh, to the point where uh, I think it was last year the uh, U.S. Naval Academy uh, named one of their boats trawler bait. <laughs> uh, uh, a fair amount of them vanish without a trace, right? Which is hard because you don't know what actually happened to it. Um, I, uh, the sail buoy, which is the Norwegian guys, had a um, they had some kind of electrical failure last year, uh, and then the boat got found, um, which meant that they were able to diagnose it and, and try again this year. Um, they actually have a reasonable chance of making it um, for the west to east course, and they're they're out, actually out there right now. If you go to the microtransat site, you can. You can watch their progress, which I certainly have been. Uh, okay. Yeah, you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the purposes of not being picked up by random people that might want to steal it, and what colors or you know what what do you consider when you're deciding how to paint it or how to color it? <laughs> so a lot of that is driven by what the actual contest rules are, which is it's got to be safety orange, pretty much. Um, we could put a put something on the sails, which is you know research vessel do not molest, um, <laughs> but a big but I think a big part of our uh, of the way we're going to deal with it is we're going to choose the route so that we tend to stay away from like the Grand Banks, um, 
and other areas that have particularly dense fishing boats. The other nice thing, one of the nice things about AIS is that vessels transmit what kind of ship they are. So we can, you know, so we can have different rules for what to do about a fishing boat versus a cargo vessel. Like if we're a kilometer away from, you know, an oil tanker or a container ship, they're not going to stop and mess with us. Um, being within sight of a fishing boat, though, that's bad for our health. Um, we probably want to give them, you know, more like 10 kilometers. Basically, teach the robot fear. <laughs> Uh, green hat. Uh, we, so my feeling about having our own AIS transmitter is that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of power budget and a lot of cost uh, for what amounts to a steal me sign. So uh, no. So the North Atlantic is a big place. And if you look at marinetraffic.com, you can look at like a continuous global AIS map, right? And you, you'll see a couple of dots in the North Atlantic and they look like they're close together and you zoom in and they're 50 miles apart. So for us, it's listen for AIS, stay the hell out of everybody's way. Yes? Any thoughts on camouflage? Like painting with has Ebola or something? <laughs> <laughs> Formally against the rules. They literally said you can't paint biohazard signs? No, what it does is what it says is that you have to paint it um, for high visibility, right? So people don't run into it. And the other thing is is that if it breaks and it's like drifting, I'd kind of like anyone who sees it to pick it up, right? Because if it broke, I'd like to get it back. He would like to get it back so he could, you know, take it apart on the bench and see what the hell went wrong. Okay, any other questions? How am I doing on time? Okay, so I've been told that I need to uh, wrap it up a little early so I can get the boat off the stage and uh, clear for the next person. So thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll probably be hanging out.